Hello. Thank you for having me here to speak today, and thank you to the organizers for being so accommodating and organizing this symposium in the time of COVID. My name is Dan Chitwood, and I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University in the Department of Horticulture, and also the Department of Computational Mathematics, Science, and Engineering. I'll be talking today about topological data analysis and how we can use it to quantify plant morphology. I'm beginning with this picture of a volcano crater for a couple reasons. One is that I'm speaking to you today from this volcano. This is literally my backyard. I'm in Mexico. Um, and I think it's important that we are transparent how we're all surviving this, not only the pandemic, but also just the uh, social and political chaos. Um, and uh, my family and I are, are working through some immigration issues, and I just want to say that I'm very thankful to Mexico uh, for being so welcoming, and also my in-laws for providing a place for my husband and our family and I uh, to all be together. The second reason I'm showing you a picture of a volcano is because it's a great way to introduce topology. So topology is the study of fundamental properties of objects, very basic things, like how many things are there? We call this connected components. How many holes and loops are there in the objects? How many voids? I think we would all look at a volcano crater and say that there's something interesting topologically. At first glance, you might say there's a hole there, um, but Upon further inspection, I think we'd all agree there isn't a hole. It doesn't go through the center of the Earth. It's just a circular ridge. And this problem of is there a topological feature or isn't there is at the heart of topological data analysis. And so I am here um, in Valle de Santiago in Guanajuato, Mexico, um, at the top of this volcano. But this region is, also, is actually called uh, Las Siete Luminarias for the seven volcanoes, and there's actually nine volcanoes in the region, not seven. There's eight craters and one mountain. And um, so we come back to this problem of, it looks like there's a lot of holes here, but there really aren't. How do we detect the holes? And so at the heart of topological data analysis is something called a filter function. This is a function that provides a real number value for each of the data points in our data set. In this case, the data set is pixels, and each of these pixels has an associated elevation, our filter function. So if we go across the values of the filter function, starting at high elevation, uh, at the highest elevations, we get four different things. We call these connected components, and we record them as bars over here on this graph on the right. At uh, this elevation, we, we haven't actually completed the, the circles of a lot of these craters, but one of them we have. We actually get a hole or a loop. And so here we'll be recording loops, and we have one of them at this point. We keep on going across the filter function to lower elevation values, and then we see that we have four different things. And we record these four different things here um, at the, the next value of elevation. You can see, though, that they're not the same four things we started out with at the higher elevation. One of them, up in this corner, persisted, but three of them merged into one big blob, one connected component. So we have three to one, and then two more emerged that weren't there before. Now we see, at, at this particular elevation level, then we see our, our holes of our volcanoes. Now we, we have eight uh, holes or loops um, and one of them we had saw at the, the highest elevation, and we got seven more at this new elevation. If we keep on going, now we have three blobs, and this is caused by, again, a merging of two of them into one. And we see we have no more loops. We, we've gone so far into the crater that we can no longer see the holes. And so at this particular elevation level, we have no holes. And if you keep on going, everything merges together, and you just get one big blob. And so this whole exercise that we just went through is at the heart of topological data analysis. It's called persistent homology, this particular approach. Um, we took a filter function, elevation. This gave a real number value to each of our data points. And as we went across the values of elevation, we monitored the birth and the death 
of topological features as they arose and as they merged to, with each other. We call uh, different classes of topological features homology groups, which is really unfortunate for biology since homology is such a fundamental concept. But this is where we get words like persistent homology. In these representations of the topological features as they bo were born and died across our filter function elevation, we call these persistence barcodes. And we call this whole thing persistent homology because we're looking at the persistence of topological features across this filter function. So by using a function that applies values to each of our data points, we can look at the birth and death of topological features. And this is what captures the shape, pattern, and form of complex objects. So why are we talking about volcanoes and why are we talking about topology when we want to get to plants? And the region, reason we're interested in, in topological data analysis is because of the type of data that we're collecting. I'm a plant morphologist and the data that you're going to see today is collected from a, an X-ray computed tomography machine, X-ray CT. This machine is just like the machine in your doctor's office. Um, you pass x-rays through an object, some of those x-rays are impeded by the density of the object, and you're basically taking a photograph on the other side. You take multiple 2D images at multiple angles, and then you, from those 2D images you can reconstruct a 3D image. The animations that you're seeing here are, are some of the data that come off the machine. These data sets are volumetric images, they're composed of voxels, which are just uh, cubical complexes, and each of these voxels has an associated x-ray intensity value. How much did that region of the image impede the x-rays? The resolution of this instrument goes down to um, about like five or 10 microns. And you can see that it's capturing in great detail the internal and external features of plants and their morphology. How you would go about even quantifying or start to think about just the immense amount of spatial information in these objects is really challenging. But you can imagine with something like topological data analysis, perhaps instead of elevation, our filter function here is x-ray intensity. We proceed from the highest x-ray intensity values to the lowest. As we do so, we record the number of connected components, loops, voids, when they're born and when they die as we go across this filter function. And once we have that topological signature, a persistence barcode, we can calculate the overall similarity of the shape of any object to any other object. And so this is how we're thinking of extracting the morphological information uh, from these data sets. So topological data analysis, we're always starting with raw data. Today I'm talking to you about X-ray CT data, but as you saw with volcanoes, it can be things like spatial distributions. It can be networks like gene regulatory networks. It can be point clouds or just plain point data. From this raw data, we apply a filter function always. And from this, we get a topological summary. You just saw a persistence barcode, but I'll be talking a lot today about Euler characteristic, the relative of persistence barcode, which is persistence diagram. And you can also create graphical representations of your data, which are called REAB or mapper graphs. Finally, once you have this topological signature, you can apply all the normal tools that we do to any data set. You can apply statistics, you can apply machine learning and classifier and prediction methods. So TDA, topological data analysis, we are interested in this because it can provide quantifiable, comparable, robust, and concise summaries of the shape of data. And there's a really great motto for topological data analysis that really captures what we're trying to do. It's that shape is data and that all data have shape. At the core of this, we're quantifying um, the shape and distribution of data. And always remember um, that you can always convert shapes into data and vice versa. So today, as an example, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, barley and its morphology. So barley is one of the world's most ancient crops. It's fourth still amongst the grains after rice, wheat, and corn. Um, some of you might know that I study grapevines. I've worked for wineries, and this is my first introduction to plants, and I still research grapevines. So if, if I was to study another thing, I'm very happy to study a plant that has been used to make alcoholic beverages for a very long uh, period of time. And like all the other crops of the world, there were wild relatives of uh, barley, but through domestication, 
we dramatically altered uh, morphology and in many different ways. And there's a lot of natural variation and it suits a lot of different purposes for agriculture and the harvest of this crop. Um, I'll come back to this, but one of the, the most uh, largest contributors to morphological variation in the spike, the inflorescence, is two versus six row barley. This is something where the genetic basis of this trait is known. It's been modified and selected for throughout domestication. There's still two row barley, uh, but people obviously wanted six row barley for yield and other reasons as well. And this does affect uh, things like the morphology of the seed, which I'll come back to. So um, for our material, we're collaborating with Dan Koenig, and Dan got his hands um, on this amazing resource. So this resource was created back in the uh, 1920s, and uh, the founders of this resource took all the, the different founder lines and land races of barley from across the world, from across uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And then this is, took a lot of dedication uh, to create the design of this resource. So from the 28 parent combinations, they did all pairwise crosses and created about 380 F1s. They selfed these 380 F1s into F2 families. And then the pooled F2 families were grown out in a giant field in Davis, California. And they did so for almost 60 generations intermittently throughout the, the 1900s. So this is an experiment that went on for more than 60 years. Um, they kept the seeds uh, from each generation, um, and now Dan Koenig and uh, his lab are growing these out. Uh, they're sequencing the, the, the DNA, and also we can keep the, the spikes and, and parts of the plant and look at their morphology. And so the idea is to see when you took all, these original, all this original genetic material from the founder lines and then just placed them into Davis, California for 60 generations, uh, how does selection act on uh, different alleles and different loci? And then separate from that question, but connected to it is, are these very subtle evolutionary changes across 60 generations from one generation to the next, do they manifest in morphology? So we went about uh, trying to measure uh, the morphology of these, these lines. Uh, this picture here is the X-ray CT scanner. It's basically a giant lead box. Um, at its heart, it's a very simple technology. Uh, there's an X-ray source here that you can't see. You put your object on this pedestal and it rotates. And then there's an X-ray CT detector here, which is taking 2D images of different angles. Um, over here, we have uh, supercomputers um, that are basically reconstructing um, uh, all this data, which takes a lot of GPU computing power. We randomize all of our samples, 875 individual spikes, um, and we keep track of orientation and foam blocks, uh, floral foam, so because it's not very x-ray dense. And then in this one slide is, is a lot of work that doesn't do justice to how hard this is. Um, it's the, the most difficult part is not the topological data analysis or the math, it's actually the image processing. And so Tim Ophelders and Eric Mezquita, they started with raw scans. They normalize the X-ray uh, intensity values of these scans. They clean up the air and the foam, and they segment away and, and prune uh, these spikes to give us the actual data that we work with. And then through a real heroic effort, Eric Mezquita, he used the X-ray intensity values of the seeds as a threshold to isolate 38,000 seeds. And they kind of have this uh, very like uh, loaf of bread or pecan type uh, shape with a, a little indent in the middle. I like how um, the, we're at a resolution limit that these seeds look a little Minecraft-ish and you can actually see the voxels. I think it reminds us that we're dealing with a cubicle complex um, that is very much voxel based. Using allometry, which is the, the relationships of how like uh, dimensions like length and width and height vary with uh, to each other with the size of the seed, uh, Eric was able to find these outliers, but he single-handedly by eye went through all these outliers to verify that there was truly something wrong with the seed due to various image processing defects. Um, and that's how we got a really clean data set of 38,000 seeds. And then uh, Eric used kind of a very simple trick just by performing a, a principal component analysis on this each isolated seed, the, the main axis ends up being the length, 
and then the other orthogonal axes from the PCA end up being the height and the width. So that's an immediate way to create orientation um, on these seeds. And then once we have that orientation, we can measure super traditional things like length, width, height, volume, surface area, convex holes, and, and things like uh, that. And then just at a first glance, looking at these very traditional measures of, of things like convex areas, heights, areas, and max heights, over three generations, and these generations are spaced across the 60 generations, like the beginning, middle, and end, you can see that we are detecting subtle morphological changes. Um, and I'm really quite, quite proud of this because um, it's really taking a snapshot of the very subtle morphological changes that are happening as we go from one generation uh, to the next in this population. But that's, uh, we're putting together these traits together with uh, genetic variation and seeing how uh, various alleles and genes change across the generations um, and how, of course, this impacts morphology. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Today, I want to talk to you about what if we wanted to go beyond those traditional measures? There's obviously more to the shape than height, width, volume, and area. How would we apply topological data analysis to maximize the amount of information that we are extracting from this data? How do we fulfill the vision that all shape is data and that all data has shape? And uh, I'll be talking about a, a topological signature, the Euler characteristic transform that you can use for that. So the Euler characteristic was first devised by Euler uh, long ago. Uh, he and a contemporary were uh, looking at things like platonic solids. And if you uh, treat a platonic solid kind of like a mini graph, so that it has vertices and edges and faces, Euler found that if you take the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces, that it, this number is always 2 for the platonic solids. And you'll notice platonic solids are topologically similar. You can deform them into all these shapes, but they always remain basically a single blob. So this Euler characteristic is, is a topological summary and it has topological meaning. There's a theorem that converts it more into topological data analysis that the number of connected components minus the number of loops plus the number of voids is equivalent to the Euler characteristic. And so topologists, as you might imagine, um, are really into all these crazy types of shapes. Um, you have basically a single connected component with an Euler characteristic of two, as you would expect, but you have all these weird tori, single, double, triple, and uh, things like Mobius strips and Klein bottles, and they all have very different Euler characteristic numbers. So Euler characteristic is different for things that are topologically different, but you have to keep in mind that it might be the, still the same for things that are vastly topologically different. For example, all these very different shapes still have a topological signature of zero. So an Euler characteristic is a topological signature. It's a good summary, but it doesn't keep track of every single topological feature like I showed you with the volcanoes at the beginning of this talk. And before I get into how we use the Euler characteristic, I want to step back to the, the persistent homology and the barcodes to show you how um, you can truly encode all the topological information. Because we're using the Euler characteristic because the other ways of calculating topology are too computationally intensive. So at the heart of uh, measuring these topological features across a filter function, what we're actually doing is creating graphs or networks. So the same way that you might have uh, eight or nine independent volcanoes, but then eventually they get all connected up into a blob, the filter function and the values of the filter function are telling you when to put in these edges. When do you create an edge? When do you create a face? As you go across the filter function, which is real number values associated with each data point, and you put in these edges that creates a dynamic network that keeps on building up, um, what, what, are the, what is the topological features of the, of the network? How many components, loops, and voids? When we're dealing with X-ray CT images, um, keep in mind it is a graph. It's a very special form of graph or simplicial complex. It's a cubical complex, but as uh, each of these uh, spaces has an X-ray intensity value, uh, 
you can really easily imagine how we would create connected components, loops, and voids as we uh, started to build the network as we go across our filter function. And again, this is persistent homology. Instead of volcanoes, I'm going to show you the example we typically show for persistent homology, which is we show an overall topological feature for our data that we're trying to detect. For example, a giant loop or hole. But we also make this hole not so clean. Our data is always messy, um, and there's all these other sub-features uh, in our data. The filter function in this case is just the distance of points to each other. And you can think of distance as a growing radius. And as the radius grows, we count, and these radii uh, start touching each other. We can count how many connected components. There's a lot in this image. Or things, we can count how many loops. So we had zero loops here. Here we have this uh, subloop. Um, here we have two loops. This one is born as we go to here, and we still have this loop here. And in this image, we have three loops. We still have this subloop. Uh, this one now arose from here, and now we have our, our big loop, right? And the big loop, it keeps on persisting for a while because it's a, it's a big component of, of the shape of our object, and eventually you get one plop. On the next slide, I'm going to show you an alternative way to a persistence barcode to represent data, which is called a persistence diagram. Instead of a bar for each topological feature, there's just going to be a data point. And the x-axis is going to be when the data point is born, and the y-axis is when that, uh, that data point, that topological feature, dies. So if we're looking at the number of loops here, there's a number of small loops, and they're born, and they die really quickly. So they, they stay on this diagonal. But the big, uh, the big loop, that's the main topological feature, it was born early, but it died very late. And so these persistence diagrams have all the information of a persistence barcode, but it's really easy to see uh, the, the most persistent topological features of the data. And one more representation of uh, topology is a graph itself. So uh, we call these mapper or, or read graphs. Let's say that this is your data. The filter function is the directional axis here. And then we also have these overlapping intervals in our data. And so from these overlapping intervals, we can create a graph. And the way that we do this is that all data points that have the associated filter function value for a certain interval are assigned uh, to that interval. And then if the points are separated, they can form uh, two nodes. Like uh, these, all these points are close together, so they're topologically a single feature, but these two are separate. Then, because these are overlapping, if there's shared points between these two intervals, then an edge goes in. And that's how we can convert our data to a much more uh, simple graph in which embedded in this graph is the topological information, which is recording the shape of our data. So back to Euler characteristic. Why are we doing this instead and what is it? So what I'm showing you here is, is how you can apply the Euler characteristic to a barley seed. Uh, the filter function here is uh, three different axes, and we just concatenate them together. And at different thresholds across these axes, what we're doing is for the simplicial complex up until that threshold, we are calculating the Euler characteristic. So we're, we're capturing um, the, the topological features of the entire simplicial complex using the Euler characteristic um, at each of these different thresholds across these different filter functions, which is just length, width, and height here. And uh, the main reason we're using Euler characteristic is because you can imagine at micron resolution with that many voxels for something the size of an apple um, that we have too many topological features. We have too many bars on our persistence barcode. We have too many points in our persistence diagram. And it, it just becomes unmanageable computationally. And Euler characteristic, on the other hand, is just really it's just a single number value at each of these thresholds for each of these different um, filter functions. But there's another overriding reason why we're doing it this way. So there's a theorem by Kate Turner that says that the Euler characteristic transform is injective, which means that it's a one-to-one -one function. And they say that um, if you took an infinite number of directional axes and calculated Euler characteristic curves for them, that this would lead to different Euler uh, characteristics and different uh, Euler characteristic transforms. Because of this, it becomes possible to back calculate what the original object was. Keep in mind this is for an infinite number of things. They've also proven that you can use a finite number of things 
except that finite number is quite large. But in the back of all our minds mathematically, even though we can create a topological signature that extracts the information of objects that we can use for analysis, we very dearly hope in the future that we can back calculate from topological signatures to the original object, which is kind of a holy grail. So that's one of the reasons we do it this way. Anyways, how do we apply this to barley seeds? And remember, the objective here is to empirically extract all the shape information that we can. So um, this is the work of Eric Mezquita. And uh, what he did was he took uh, 74 different equidistant directional axes. And for each of these different axes, he creates 32 thresholds per direction that he's calculating the Euler characteristic for. So we get this huge vector of 74 times 32, whatever that number is, just a chain of numbers that's a vector of, of 74 times 32, which is encapsulating all the information content with, with respect to morphology of this seed. And so then what we do is, is we need some sort of, of distance metric using this information. And so what Eric does is he, for each pairwise combination of the founders, the parents of this population, he, uh, he performs a dimension reduction technique, uh, multi-dimensional scaling. And then once for each of these pairwise combinations, the founders, he has his MDS plot, he then applies a, a support vector machine, an SVM, which is basically calculating a hyperplane to best separate two of these founders. He then uh, uses the accuracy of, of how well this separation occurs as the overall similarity between the two lines. And so, for example, once you have calculated these accuracies for all the pairwise combinations of the founders, you can kind of get this distance matrix of the overall similarity of each founder founder's seeds to the others. And once we have a pairwise distance matrix, we can, of course, do things like hierarchical clustering. And we're just starting to use this data for genetic purposes and other things like that. But what I'm showing you here is kind of a gut check just to make sure that this is actually working. And so we were very happy to see that in this hierarchical clustering that two and six row barley was more or less uh, separated. And you can also do other analysis on these really long vectors like a, like a PCA. And you can see that the separation of two and six row barley is coming from uh, these patterns in the distribution. And this plot is a little bad because it's over plotted, but you can see that the six row barley creates this heart shape, whereas the two row barley is more centered at the base of the heart. And so what's happening here in the six row barley is you have a center left and right uh, seed. And just by the way they pack, it creates some asymmetries, whereas the two row barley is more or less symmetrical. And so it's this asymmetry that starts to tease out left, right, and central uh, kind of shapes in six row versus two row barley. So that's just one example of, of how this shape information is actually um, quantifying the overall similarity and differences between these seeds. And so we have a lot more work to do. Uh, we want to go beyond seeds and look at the whole uh, uh, spike inflorescence architecture. And of course, we're putting this together with the population genetic analysis of Dan Koenig at UC Riverside, who's looking at the genetic changes in this population. Uh, but of course, we want to put together this genetic information with morphology, not only to see how both uh, morphology and genetics change across these generations, but how they're connected. And I talked a lot about barley today, but there's a lot of other things we, we have in the works, and there's such beautiful shapes that come from this X-ray CT. Uh, we're working with Danelle Seymour at UC Riverside in their citrus collection. Uh, with Asia Downton here at Michigan State University and the Department of Forestry, uh, we're starting to look at these tree cookies, they call them, these slices from trees. Tree rings scan beautifully, and we really want to get into dendrochronology. And then uh, with Pat Brown at UC Davis, uh, we're looking at a lot of different walnut lines. And what's neat about this project is for every walnut that we scan, uh, Pat is looking at metrics of like shell strength and splitability of uh, the walnut for walnut breeding, but this is modeling functional traits um, as a function of uh, shape. So, so that's very interesting. And so in my, in my last uh, minutes here, I kind of wanted to get an overview of kind of in the directions we're heading to try to measure the, the spike and panicle. Remember, there's these mapper graphs. And if you pick the right directional axis, for example, the rachis, um, the proximal distal axis of the spike, 
you can see that with these overlapping intervals, you're going to pick up on the rachis and the on architecture uh, really cleanly. It's kind of like a hand. You can pick different filter functions, though, that are a little less intuitive. For example, if you use x-ray intensity, which is what uh, Eric used to isolate the seeds themselves, that you get this graph architecture where the seeds are connected to the rachis. Um, and the, the nice thing about mapper graphs is, is that when you create this graph, it assigns data points to nodes and edges so that there's a, a correspondence between the resulting graph and the original data such that you can go right back to the data um, and see what points were contributing to this graph architecture. The citrus um, we're really excited about because we really want to try to up our image analysis skills and isolate anatomy. So here you're seeing uh, an attempt to try to get the, the skin, the rind, um, and the flesh of uh, the citrus separated. But I also want to speak about how topological data analysis can maybe um, open our minds to new and creative ways of how we conceptualize and study and extract the information from morphology. The, you may have picked up that you can pick any filter function you want, and each filter function measures the shape comprehensively, but in different ways. In this particular filter function that you're seeing here for the citrus, what I like is, is that even though a citrus is not, you wouldn't think of it as a branching object, that you can pick filter functions that really key in on branching concepts. And I really think it's important that we, we focus on this branching concept because it's a, it's a pattern and a shape that's very unique to plants. And I think thinking of shape in this way might reveal new things. So what you're looking at here is a, a polar coordinate representation of the citrus. The y-axis is the, the, from the bottom to the top of the citrus, and the x-axis is uh, the median uh, values going across um, different angles of the citrus. So this is as if you unwrapped the citrus. The filter function that we're using here is geodesic distance. It's the, to the base of the citrus. It's the, close, the smallest distance along the object itself to that point, the base except that we've weighted the uh, intensity values of each voxel so that the more intense the value of the voxel, the shorter the distance. So it creates this kind of canalization, uh, like a river, uh, going through things like veins and other dense objects uh, within the citrus. And what you're seeing here is how many paths of each voxel go through each voxel. So um, you should think of this like all these rivers trying to get to the base of the citrus and we're recording how many of those rivers go through each of the voxels. And it picks up really nicely on things like vasculature um, and all these intricate features of the citrus. And what you're seeing is basically an, an embedded recording of, of all this information, but from this very specific type of view of, of branching. And this was uh, done by Tim Ophelders a uh, postdoc of Liz Munch and I, who was uh, studying braided rivers from satellites. Um, so that's just one example of how we can think very creatively and measure shape in new ways. A major thrust that we want to go into the future and focus that I'm really excited about is work with uh, Rhonda Montgomery, Arjun Krishnan, uh, Liz Munch here at MSU, and a man husbands at OSU. And we're interested in creating uh, growing phenotypes. We want to create time lapses of Arabidopsis growth and apply TDA, um, not only looking at TDA as a, as a time series, but also as a four-dimensional uh, object as the plant grows. But we're also going to take uh, RNA-seq time series at the same time that we're taking X-ray CT measurements. And like I said, uh, you can apply TDA to the shape of networks as well. And so if we're creating topological signatures for both gene regulatory networks as well as the phenotype, the overall morphology of an organism, across development, across time, we're in a common framework where we can model uh, molecular profiles in terms of phenotype and vice versa. Um, and this really, I think, is, is getting at how can we predictively look at molecular profiles to phenotype and uh, the other way around too. And I just want to end with that TDA can be really applied to anything and to any data set you can apply any filter function. And there's all sorts of applications that I think really need to be looked at um, from this perspective of let's extract the maximum amount of information from our data. 
Um, you can see point data works really well. You can think of things like bacteria distributions or pathology or epidemiology in the field, spray applications and little droplets, satellite data and patterns of vegetation, LIDAR especially, um, shapes, structures, and patterns. Um, I've studied the shapes of leaves and other plant morphological structures, but you can imagine the shapes of uh, hyperspectral data, which really has both spatial and spectral information embedded within it. Soil structures, uh, which can be very complicated, but are directly related to various microenvironments. And finally, especially branching, roots, hyphae, um, canopies, vasculature, and gene regulatory networks themselves. Um, so you can apply topology to anything, and I think for these uh, very large data sets that we find ourselves with, in the age of big data, where we all say that we have this problem. How do we analyze it? How do we efficiently and concisely extract the information from big data? Uh, topological data analysis is coming from the data science field, and it was built for this problem of you have this complicated, these complicated, intricate big data sets. How do we data sketch them, extract the information, and capture everything so that we can model it appropriately. That's what topological data analysis does. So uh, above all, I want to thank uh, Liz Munch. Uh, we work together on all the projects that I've talked about today. She's in math and computational mathematics, science, and engineering at, at Michigan State. Um, and she's the topological data analysis uh, expert. And uh, Eric uh, was really responsible for implementing a lot of these analysis in Barley. Michelle Quigley does the x-rays uh, from the machine. Tina Offelder is our former postdoc who was also helping with these analysis. And Dan Koenig and Jacob Landis um, who were uh, providing uh, the Barley and were working with on that. So uh, thank you very much. I'll take questions. Thanks.